city has been helping Syrian refugees in Turkey for five years, with some Syrians joining the ranks of volunteers. One local volunteer in Mozambique has started his business with money from the city's work for relief program. Welcome to Die Headlines. I'm Siri Su. Thank you for joining us. After eight years of civil war in Syria, Turkey became the largest country for fleeing Syrian refugees. Since 2014, the city has been helping Syrian refugees in Turkey, giving them support and holding large-scale cash card distribution every month. During this year, some Syrians also joined the volunteers by helping others in need. <laughs> Siji held nine distribution venues within two days in Turkey. From day to night, more than 5,000 Syrian refugee families received one month's worth of financial aid. This is the fifth year of Siji's commitment in Turkey. Today during the distribution, there was a woman who came to get a cash card. It was her first time here. I saw she had tears of gratefulness in her eye, and right away I knew she needs her help desperately. I'm here to share your joy and grief, just like we were sent in the song. My happiness comes from your smile. Standing at the front, these 18 Syrians have been volunteers for five years. On this day, they were not refugees, but givers. <laughs> Volunteer Mahal Omar was once a student in Manaho International School and was now admitted to Department of Dentistry in Istanbul University with the second highest grade. I learned to be a giver since I was in Menahel International School. Now I've been admitted to the university's Department of Dentistry. And I will still come back often to volunteer. A Taiwanese doctoral student has been conducting field investigation in the Middle East for more than one year. Now he shares his perspective. There's a saying in Arabic that goes, because we are one family. I saw Ziji assisting the Syrians, helping themselves and their community. Through my observation, I saw the global Ziji volunteer spirit was put into practice. Thanks for Ziji now, I've become a happy volunteer. As of seeing the light at the end of the tunnel, these Syrian migrants in Turkey finally get some comfort and support in this foreign country. In October 2017, after knowing Siji was holding a fresh produce distribution, Monson Antonio College contacted U.S. Siji headquarters and asked for help for their impoverished students. After a series of discussion coordination, in October 2019, Siji held a food distribution and free clinic for them. The Daai Mobile Food Pantry arrived at the Mount San Antonio College in Pomana, California. There are about one-third of the patients today who never had eye checkers before. If they need it, we'll give them a pair of glasses. If not, we could still provide an eye checkups. Brianna has had a blurry vision since elementary school and needed glasses. But her mother didn't believe her without proof of an examination. My daughter, <laughs> uh, she always in, in a classroom and she said, Mama, I can't see, I can't see. And I'm like, uh, and I was just thinking, okay, she just wanted to wear glasses because all the other kids have glasses. And so she said, Mama, I can't see, I really can't see. So it wasn't until she got her eye exam and she came home and she showed me and I felt so bad. And I took it home. And I gave it to my mom, my mom, she was so shocked. She was like, you need glasses. I was like, I've been trying to tell you that for a long time. So ever since then, I've been wearing glasses and it's helped me see really good. Brianna and her mother each received a pair of glasses from Tsuji. They've also received regular vision checkups from now on. 
U.S. Tsuji headquarters began to care for the student in Mount San Antonio College, including joining their school distribution venue since the new semester in 2019. After the student received daily necessities and vegetables, Tsuji volunteer provided them some multi-grain powder and Tsuji's instant rice. It's not very easy for the students to cook if they have no kitchen at their place. Even the ones who have, they're unlikely to cook too. Thus, our instant rice is very suitable for their needs. They gave me the, the measuring cup, put some hot water. Yes, it's great. But yeah, thank you. This means a lot. You know, it, it's helpful for us students, us struggling students. But yeah, thank you. Thank you so much. The school cared for the students, so they contacted USGG headquarters. And after many back and forth discussion and coordination, they finally allowed Suji to hold food distribution and clinic for their students. A storm in Johor Bahru, Malaysia, has caused floods and other damages. Therefore, city volunteers have traveled there to clean up the disaster areas. It allowed the survivors to return to their normal lives. On October 22nd, a morning storm in Johor Bahru, Malaysia caused thunders and also floods. Among the affected areas, a village in Geram Patan Pulite and one in Ulu Pulite suffered the most severe damage. 72 families or 310 people from these two villages are affected by the floods. Some survivors have to stay in shelter. The flood came very quickly. There's a river in front of our house, and the river is connected to the sea, so the end of the river is the sea. The flood came too fast. In less than an hour, the flood rose up to this height. The land is full of yellow mud with piles of furniture, wet exercise books, and discarded clothes. Villagers' homes are in a mess. The flood rose up here to this level. This is where it reached, so nothing survived. This furniture is ruined completely. Only the items at the back of the house and home appliances are saved. Only the fridge and the TV are saved. Everything is ruined. Mattresses are all soaking wet. Pillows are ruined. I just threw away the clothes we can't wear anymore. I can't clean away everything in just one day. I'll need at least one week. When things are ruined, we can't do anything about them. There's nothing we can do. After Tsuji volunteers evaluated the conditions of the disaster, they got more people to help survivors clean up their houses. I feel the most important thing is to show them our care because their houses have been flooded, so many properties have been damaged. At this moment, they don't seem to have anything at all. Nobody likes to encounter this kind of situation, so we can help them as much as possible so they can return to their normal lives as quickly as possible. Seeing Tsuji volunteers helping villagers without regard to their different religions, the villagers are deeply moved. I'm thankful that the volunteers came to help us. The fans are merciless, but people have love. Tsuji volunteers lent a helping hand immediately, so these survivors are able to rebuild their houses and to live normal lives again. And they can sense there's love everywhere. In the aftermath of Cyclone Idai, Tsuji has inspired many local volunteers. Among them is a man Isaka, who is staying with his uncle since his home was destroyed. With the money he earned from Tsuji's work relief program, he repaired his uncle's house and started a store on the roadside selling drinks. Joining other city volunteers in conducting home visits, he has seen other impoverished residents. Therefore, he has a dream. Not only does he want to build his own home, he hopes to build a big house to help the impoverished people. Yeah. Once trucks stop here, the young man approaches them selling his drinks. He's running very fast because there are many competitors doing the same business. He said that when business is good, he can earn about 20 U.S. dollars a day. The young man's investment on his small roadside business comes from Tsuji's work for relief program. In the aftermath of Cyclone Idai, his house was destroyed and he had to move to his uncle's house in Hamadenda. 
While it is dusty, the weather is hot too. The volunteers made home visit despite a 41 degree heat. The men's uncle's house has furniture and partitions. This is one of the few houses in Hamadanda that can protect people from the elements. When the volunteers enter the kitchen to see what they usually eat, the man's aunt pointed to a few cold sweet potatoes. <laughs> After receiving the help from Tsuji, the man has joined the ranks of volunteers. They visited a solitary grandmother who relies on government subsidies of about two U.S. dollars a month. At age 70, she grows corns and relies on a little rice that the organization gave her. She eats rice with salt and vegetables from the farm. In fact, she felt sad and cried. I asked, why would you do when you finish eating these? She said she does not know. Only God knows. The barren land is where the man will realize his dream. He wants to save money to buy land and rebuild his home. His dream is to build his own house. After that, he wants to build another house to accommodate the people in need. He hopes that the impoverished people in Namatanda will not suffer anymore. He hopes they will have a different future. Despite suffering from poverty, the man still has hope about the future. In China, today volunteers in Shenyang started caring for 59-year-old Yu Shushen from April this year. He's suffering from polio and rheumatism and cannot take care of himself. Today volunteers also took him to the hospital to seek medical treatment. Yu Shushen looks forward to going out once a week. His right hand and right leg are affected by polio, while his left hand is impacted by rheumatism. He cannot take care of himself. If his rheumatism can be cured, the condition of his left hand and left leg will be improved. If his pain can be alleviated, he could feel better and begin to take care of himself. Chi volunteers were taking the wheelchair down the stairs carefully, step by step. His neighbor met him accidentally and was also happy for him. He's happier than before. It must be you who helped him a lot. <laughs> with a view to cure Yu Shenzhen's rheumatism, the hospital responds to Chi Chi's love and provide him with free medical treatment. We provide free medical service to Chi Chi's referred patients. We save many people every day. Some have special conditions like bone fractures. After receiving medical treatment, Chi Chi volunteers carefully took Yu Shenzhen back home. This allows his 70-year-old sister and 62-year-old brother to have a chance to rest. It's fine. All of us are here to help. Don't be sad. It's good to have you. I don't know how to express my gratitude. Don't say that. We are a family. All of us can help him. Because of Shen Yang Chi Ji volunteer's care, Yu Shenzhen's mind also changed. I was wrong in the past, but now I changed and won't do anything wrong again. Thirty-six-year-old Patrick Joe Sayama is a potential stem cell donor when he was in high school. Ten years later, he was informed to be a successful match for a marrow donation when he was about to release his first music album. Thus, he postponed his schedule for album release and saved a patient's life. <laughs> Patrick Cho was a singer-songwriter who once joined the Peripheral Blood Stem Cell Donation Campaign during his high school period. 
Ten years later, he was informed to be a successful match for the donation. However, he was preparing for his album release at that time. This is the album. Although his music was about to release to the market, he decided to postpone his album release since he had to keep his body in the best shape for the transplantation. I negotiated with my boss about the album release schedule. She encouraged me to go save the patients first without hesitation. Patrick Chow is 180 centimeters tall but was weighing 66 kilograms when he was informed of the match. In order to keep my body in the best shape for donation, I ate a lot of food and kept exercising till I gained 10 more kilograms. When the preparation was all said, some incident happened during his donation. I had some pain and the blood vessels in my arm was protruding. There was some congestion about it. The doctor said I had vascular rupture. Still, he completed the donation successfully. Although seven years has passed, he still remembers the unforgettable experience. And now he is giving his sincere blessings to his bone marrow recipient. I am not a hero. I was just trying my best to do what I could for you. Although I only helped you once in your life, I wish you could cherish our relationship and my blessings. Live well, because there are many people who need you. In today's serious report about the food we eat, we investigate the school lunches in urban city schools as compared to those in rural countryside. We also learn about perhaps why those students in the countryside are more likely to get sick and suffer from allergies. With not much in his wallet, Chen Boyi needs to pick and choose his purchase carefully. Sometimes I don't have much money, so I just buy less. When I have more money, I buy more items. I started doing this since the eighth grade because my grandmother couldn't do it anymore. So I come buy ingredients here and cook for the family when I get home. Raised in a single-parent family, Chen Bo Yi spends a lot of time with his grandmother when his father is at work. However, three years ago, his grandmother had spinal surgery and suffered mobility issues. Thus, the boy took over cooking at the age of 13. My son is very mature for his age. I'm grateful. Since our family situation isn't ideal, I appreciate that he's so mature and thoughtful. An alarming 44 percent of families in remote regions do not prepare breakfast for their children to eat. Thus, over half of the students don't have breakfast to eat, so they go to school hungry. Sometimes I forgot to leave food at the house, and the kids will call and ask me what they can eat, and I say, sorry, I forgot. Living in Jai's Alishan Township, Yiro takes care of herself when she gets home from school, as her parents are still working. Not having a set meal time is often the worry of students in these remote regions. According to surveys, though the percentage of children under 18 in rural townships of Taiwan without lunches are decreasing as compared to previous years, there are still 3 percent of kids without lunches to eat. The difference between urban children and country children are their health, entertainment and nutrition. It's still quite a gap. Jiayi's Adisan Township has nine elementary schools listed in the Ministry of Education as severely remote school. And where I'm standing, Shizhi Elementary is one of them. This school has only 12 students, and as you can see, this teacher only has two students. Educational resources in remote regions are not lacking in manpower, but to come up with a nutritional lunch is another issue. The quality of the vegetables we get might not be as good, while we also don't have a nutritionist on staff. 
So all we can do is search on the internet for meal ideas which is suitable for children to eat. Sometimes the meal we eat at school are dishes we don't get to eat at home. The nutritious lunch meal is very satisfying too, Yiro. Yet, Shizi Elementary's budget for school lunches is very low compared to the city elementaries. Thus, these rural kids lose at the starting line once again. Statistics show school lunch budget island-wide is on average 43 NT dollars per child, but some Taipei City children eat about 60 NT dollars a meal, while some in Yunlin only eat about 34 NT dollars per meal. Shizi Elementary is on the lower end of the spectrum. When the school lunch budget is lower, then the food ingredients they purchase reflect that and are perhaps more processed foods or items that are starchy, which gives a fast, fulfilling feeling when eaten. But long-term-wise, those items aren't as good for the children. An unbalanced diet can cause weight gain in some remote region children, which adversely affects their health, and diseases related to that are also more likely to happen. Research shows there are more than 20 percent of children from remote regions who have allergies, and also near 60 percent of children from disadvantaged families have food problems, with 40 percent of them being they don't eat well, and another 40 percent being they don't get enough to eat. This long-term dietary problem can cause children from disadvantaged families getting sick 20 percent more likely than the average family. However, the school lunch situation in the city is vastly different. I'm standing in Huiwen Elementary School, which is the second largest elementary school in Taichung City. It teaches 2,650 students. Besides plenty of educational resources, their school lunch is very abundant. We try to use fresh produce as much as possible and decrease less processed foods. Four dishes and one soup plus fruits. Each of the students' lunch bowls are filled to the brim. According to calculations, about one fourth of school lunch provided will go to waste. What the students don't eat end up here in their kitchen refuse. Huiwen Elementary produces about 400 kilograms each school day of kitchen refuse. One fourth of the daily school lunch is uneaten and headed to become livestock feed. I think we need to step by step change the children's views, as some children are used to getting their way at home, and the parents will just give them whatever they like to eat. So the kitchen staff encourages the students not to waste food. When comparing the children's school lunches, those living in the rural countryside are lackluster and not enough, it seems like. Not only filling the stomach, it's important to eat well, and that's the basic rights of the children, no matter if they are in the urban city or rural countryside. And it is up to the parents, society, and the government to safeguard these fundamental rights, ensuring they don't go hungry as well as getting a balanced diet to eat. The 2019 International Tea Festival has been held in San Francisco's Palace of Fine Arts. City volunteers from Northern California seize the opportunity to promote tea culture and city's humanistic spirit. We'll leave you with these images. Thank you for joining us. Goodbye.